Hey, what's up everybody? TrophyNet here and welcome back to Gwent Edge. In this show we talk about specific Gwent cards or interesting decks to play around with. CD Projekt Red added 5 new faction leaders to the game a while back and we've been busy taking a closer look at each of them and how to use them effectively. We continue the series with Ardal Ep Dehi, the new Nilfgaard faction leader. Important note first, all 5 of the new leaders are characters from Thronebreaker, Gwent's single player campaign. This entire video is however spoiler free, so we will not be talking about any story details from Thronebreaker. Everyone still here? Great, here we go. Ardal is a peculiar leader. If you've watched some of my videos you might have noticed I'm not a big fan of Nilfgaard decks. They're the biggest disruptors in the bunch, locking everything you play or just breaking your strategies before you even begin. I'm looking at you pesky usurpers. But Ardal makes things a bit more tactical, pun intended. Ardal can seize an enemy unit, meaning he can move it over from your enemy side to yours. The maximum power that unit can have depends on the amount of tactic cards you have in your deck. It starts off at 3 power, but is increased by 1 for every 4 tactic cards in your deck. With 8 tactic cards, which is what we're going for here, this allows you to seize an enemy of 5 power or less. This gets you 10 points, plus 5 for you and minus 5 for your opponent, and possibly control over your hand the engine card. So this ability can be extremely useful. In fact, Nilfgaard as a whole is all about control over your opponents and taking them out where needed. Let's talk about the tactic cards themselves first. We need 8 of them if you want to be able to seize an enemy unit of up to 5 power, but tactic cards have a high provision cost in general, so we need to be careful. We have two assassination cards and two imperial diplomacy cards to fill out half our tactical requirement. Assassination allows you to deal 6 damage to a unit, which is reduced by 1 for each adjacent unit, down to a minimum of 4. A simple card capable of quickly dispatching weaker but still dangerous opponents, so use it as you please. Imperial Diplomacy on the other hand lets you choose between 3 random bronze cards from your opponent's faction and spawn that card on your side of the board. It's a good way to start of the match if you don't have anything else that's useful, but this card is mostly filler. Then we get to the more interesting tactics. Treason forces an enemy unit to damage its adjacent units by its own power. This can be devastating in the late game against high power units like the ones used in Gurney Korra decks. We'll be hearing more about them later. Ghyberi allows you to choose from three random cards from your opponent's starting deck and spawn a copy of it on your side of the board. This card is a lot more useful than Imperial Diplomacy, since the selection pool is a lot more restricted and it usually gives you at least one option worth the 8 provision cost. Vigo's Muzzle allows you to lock and seize an enemy unit of 5 power or less. In our case this basically is another charge for your leader ability, but with the caveat that the unit is locked first, which we can however remedy, or on that in a second. Last but not least we have Commander's Horn, boosting up to 5 adjacent units by 3 each for a whopping total of 15 points. To benefit a bit from these tactic cards we also add 2 Fire Scorpions. These fiery arbalasts deal 1 damage on order and gain a charge every time we play a tactic card. They also only require 4 provision so that's an easy addition to the deck. Our biggest play in this deck however is Stefan Skellen, the Imperial Coroner and one of the main antagonists from the Witcher books. His order ability allows you to replay a tactic card you played that turn. In our case this means you can play Commander's Horn twice for a possible 30 points or Vigo's Muzzle to acquire two of your opponent's unit for a maximum of 20 points. Scallon can single-handedly turn the match around for you if you can keep him alive for one turn that is. The other aspect of Nilfgaard that we cannot leave unused is Locking. Locking allows you to disable a unit's abilities and is currently still very hard to counter since CD Projekt Red does not allow us to toggle a lock with any lock ability like we could in the beta. This means there's only three ways to remove a lock, one of them exclusively in the Nilfgaard faction. Mahakam Ale can remove a lock and boost the unit by three, you've seen that guard a lot in my deck since I usually at least add one of them. Diaguara can lock or unlock depending on her position and the strongest card on this front is Kalok Differin, removing all statuses from every unit on the board including immunity. Kalok is a very interesting card that I rarely see played but we can use him to counter Eridan immunity decks for example 
or unlock cards that we've seized with Vigo's Muzzle. A very versatile and powerful card for only 7 provision cost. Especially with Crimson Curse, which will add a lot more statuses to the game, this might see a lot more uses than it does now. But we can do a lot of locking ourselves as well. Not counting Vigo's Muzzle, we have 5 cards that can lock enemy units. The Aguaya, 2 Alba Armored Cavalry units, Aux and Letho of Gullet. The latter can only do so if Aux is in your hand, however. These cards should be enough to counter any engine cards your opponent can play without going all out. We also have a few cards that benefit from locked units. Vanamar can destroy a locked unit, allowing you to lock a high power unit first and then destroy it outright. With a provision cost of only 7, Vanamar can generate a lot of potential in one go. You might wonder why we don't have Sarit in the deck to complete the Viper School trio with Aux and Leto. Well, I needed the extra provisions to add a glass cannon to the deck, but you can add Sarit instead if you want to have a safer bet. That glass cannon is Vatier de Rideau. His order ability allows you to seize a locked enemy unit. This can be extremely devastating if your opponent has been building a big high power unit. Lock it on your next turn and double up those points in your favor in one fell swoop. However, Vatier needs to be on the melee row and only has 3 power. Combine that with his ability being an order ability and it can be easily countered by either killing him or moving him around. I usually keep him until the end of the round so your opponent's options are very limited and you can get the most points out of Vatier himself. Keep in mind that I've created this deck to have a strong team and valid tactics. This does not mean you can't do anything else with it, and that it doesn't have any weaknesses. Both of our biggest plays, Scallon and Valtier, have order abilities and can be easily countered in the turn we have to wait. This can be of course supplemented with the Blizzard Potion to get a bit of a zeal off on one of them, but still, it's a very dangerous way of playing. But fun if you can pull it off. An alternative for Vatier would be to have Sarit and Letho Kingslayer instead. Letho himself allowing you to copy Skellen and playing the same tactic three times. This does mean you only have one big play, but it is a very satisfying way to pull that off. This deck shines when you play against engine heavy decks. I had the bad luck to barely play against any of those during recording, but seizing cards like Anna Stranger, the Botchling or Dogger Two Blades can really mess with your opponent's strategy. Remember, Play like the Nilf Guardians and strike where needed with locks or seizing and you will be victorious. Unless you're facing a Gurney Korra deck like everybody else does these days. And that's it for Ardal Abdei. Um, I will not be doing a Gurney Korra deck episode unless it get re gets requested here. So if you want to hear my thoughts about the Gurney Korra deck, please let me know and I will do that first. But it seems to me like everyone has a grasp on how to use Gurney. I mean. You see them played a lot, like pretty much 50% of my games are against Gurney Korra decks, but uh, they're also very easy to use. I mean, just count from 1 to 10 on the power of your units every round and you should be fine just boosting up your units as you go. It's an incredibly annoying deck to play against if you're not prepared, although Meave and Skellige counter Gurney hard if played right. But again, if you want to hear my thoughts on Gurney Korra, please let me know and I'll make a video on that as well. If you like Gwent, strategies, deck ideas and tournaments, check out my esports.net. They have a lot of tools to share your deck, keep track of active and upcoming events and they host a number of tournaments as well. The kind folks over there also share my videos regularly, so pay them a visit and let them know TrophyNut said hello. I'm really grateful for their support. Got any other tips on how to play Ardal at Dehi? Don't hesitate to leave advice in the comment section down below. Next time, we will discuss the new status effects coming in the Crimson Curse expansion at the end of the month. Check me out on Twitter if you want to talk, and if you enjoyed this video, why not give it a like? Or maybe even give the channel a subscription. Any support is really appreciated. So uh, thanks enormously for watching, and I hope to see you guys in the next episode of Gwentage. Goodbye!